Alexander, the Executive Director here at Standpoint. And uh, joining me in this webinar is Rachel Kohler. Say hello, Rachel. Rachel. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and also Ty is joining us, um, uh, moderating everything in the background. Say hello, Ty. Hello. So um, today we are here, we're going to be talking about, uh, Rachel and I are going to be talking about evidence in order for protection hearings. And um, kind of the, the idea here is, uh, this is all geared towards advocates, right? And the idea is we're not trying to turn you advocates into lawyers at all. That is not our goal. Um, our goal here is to help you as advocacy understand that there are sometimes additional things that have to happen before the judge can accept a document or accept some testimony. Um, otherwise, um, it might run afoul of the rules of evidence. And we get a lot of calls around here of people saying things like, well, the court wouldn't do this, and so they're biased against us. And then when I find out what the court wouldn't do, I'm like, yeah, no, see, they couldn't do that because of the rules of evidence. So um, that's why we decided that this might be a really helpful uh, um, conversation to have with uh, advocacy. Um, I want to remind folks, sorry, before I forget, I want to remind folks that we are recording um, this presentation and it will be posted up on our YouTube channel afterwards for folks to peruse later if they so choose. Um, and if anybody has any questions, please ask your questions through the chat function and then Ty will let us know when there are questions. And did I miss anything before I hand it off to Ty? No, great introduction. All right, yay. Uh -huh. uh, so go ahead, Ty. All right, so um, welcome again, everybody, to the webinar. I have two poll questions that I, I will be asking, and um, I'm going to launch the first one now. If you can please answer them, I'll give you about 10 seconds. How long have you been, been in your position? So when I see the numbers stop moving, I will um, close the poll out. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. And I'll share the results. And it looks like um, we have 29% of our attendees who have been in their position less than a year, 24% one to three years, 24% three to five, and 24% more than five years. It's an equal so that, spread. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. The next poll question is, do you attend OFP hearings with your clients or participants? Yes or no? All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it since it's, uh, it seems like everybody answered quickly with that one. Share the results. 89% of participants today do attend court OFP hearings with clients and 11% do not. So that that concludes the um, poll questions that I have for today. I want to go over again that if you do have questions, please type them under the questions tab. Rena and Rachel will check in throughout the presentation and answer them as we go along. If we don't get to your question during the webinar or if there are if your questions are very case specific, we will contact you after the webinar. Also, after the webinar ends, we do have several evaluation questions that we would greatly appreciate if you took the time to answer them. It gives us the feedback that we need to provide you with the most relevant topics for trainings, what is effective or ineffective, and how we can improve in the webinars and trainings that we provide for you. So that's all I have for now. I'm gonna pass it on to Rachel and Rena for the presentation. Awesome, thank you, Ty. So um, I'm going to start off today's presentation. I need to close that poll. Oh, sure. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> now you're back to my screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start off uh, the hearing talking about some things, or to start off the webinar talking about a few things that um, need to be considered prior to the hearing. Um, at the petition affidavit stage, most of you advocates are probably aware of what the standards are in applying for orders for protection and what judges are looking for, but we wanted to kind of go over them again today to rejog your memory on some of those things to remind you 
of what needs to be considered when you're presenting evidence and what kind of evidence you want to present to judges in order for protection hearings. And obviously today we're taking order for protection as the main example, but some of you may be um, handling more harassment restraining order hearings or hearings in family court. And a lot of the evidentiary rules that we're talking about today apply to multiple different kinds of hearings. Um, but we are going to talk about them today more specifically in relation to the order for protection hearing. So um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, one of the requirements for applying for an order pr for protection is you have to establish that the abuse was perpetrated by a family or household member. So the list that you're seeing on your screen right now is the list under the statute of all of the different categories of people that um, make up family or household member. So it includes spouses or former spouses, parents and children, um, blood relatives, um, people who live or used to live together in the same household. And this can include um, if you had separate sleeping areas, but you share common living spaces like kitchens or family rooms. If you have a child in common, um, if you have a pregnancy in common, which I always feel like is a super weird way of saying that, but I think it means that if you are the, the biological parents of the child where one of the parties is um, pregnant with, and then um, persons who are involved in a significant romantic or sexual relationship, this does not have to be a current relationship, it can be a previous relationship. When you're applying for the initial order for protection, so I'm going to talk today just very briefly about the standards that courts, what courts are going to be looking for when they are um, determining whether or not an, an initial order for protection should be issued on a subsequent or um, extending order for protection and on 50 year orders. So specifically for initial orders for protection, courts are looking to see whether or not that family or household member um, whether or not they have committed physical harm, bodily injury, or assault against the petitioner, or whether they've created fear of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, or assault. Um, as it states on the slide, an overt act is not necessary for this. Um, I also think it's important to, to realize that a lot of um, courts, a lot of different criminal standards are looking at whether or not a reasonable person would be in fear of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, assault. But in this particular case, it's looking to the particular petitioner. So it's not looking to whether or not a reasonable person would have feared, had that fear in that situation. It's looking at that specific petitioner and whether or not they, under the circumstances that they are in, um, would have been afraid of imminent physical harm, bodily injury, or assault. So again, that's taking in the totality of the circumstances, which obviously is including that history of past abusive behavior. Um, they will also look to whether or not the respondent has committed uh, criminal sexual conduct. That can be in first through fifth degrees. It does not have to be um, something that they have received a criminal conviction for, whether or not they've committed terroristic threats, and whether or not they've interfered with an emergency call. Um, the next standard I'm going to talk about is extending or subsequent orders for protection. Extending meaning whether or not the order for protection is still in effect. Subsequent is after the order for protection has, the previous order for protection has expired. Um, it is a lower threshold than your initial order for protection standard. Um, in order to have the judge issue an order in these cases, the court must find that a respondent has violated a prior or existing order for protection. Um, whether or not the petitioner is in reasonable fear of harm from the respondent, of physical harm from the respondent, whether or not that respondent has engaged in acts of stalking, or whether or not that respondent is incarcerated and about to be released or has been recently released from that incarceration. So unlike filing for the initial order for protection, you do not have to show that physical harm is imminent and you don't have to necessarily show that there's been a new act of domestic abuse. And then lastly, I just wanted um, to talk briefly about the 50-year orders. Um, 50 years is a very long time, so you're going to have to justify the need for the length of a 50-year order. Um, to do that, the court can find two different circumstances, either that the respondent has violated um, a prior existing order on two or more occasions, or that the petitioner has had two or more orders in effect against that same respondent. If they are able to um, file a 50-year order under this, they the court can order the respondent to refrain from committing acts of domestic abuse against the petitioner, 
or they can and or they can prohibit the respondent from having any direct or indirect contact with the petitioner. So those are just standards to sort of jog your memories into, you know, we're going to be talking about all the various forms of evidence that you can submit in these hearings, but the whole point of it is that you are meeting these various standards and that you're giving the court what the court needs in order to make a finding of domestic abuse and order the protective action. So there are a variety of possible attachments that you can um, have with the petition. So this is not, this is still before the hearing. Um, these are the most common ones that we've heard about. Um, I think the reason we put this slide in here is to remind people that um, they can attach these documents to the affidavit and to the petition. Um, and th that can be helpful, especially when you're wanting to seek an ex parte order. The judge can consider all of these documents when they're making that ex parte order determination. But at the point in which it comes to an order for protection hearing, none of the attachments that you've had to your petition or affidavit are considered evidence. So while the judge may have considered a police report at the ex parte order level, when you're at a hearing, you should not assume that the judge is going to consider that police report. You will need to resubmit that police report properly to put it into evidence at the hearing level so the judge can consider it at that time. Um, and now it's also important to note that certain judges may not allow you to attach um, anything to your pet, uh, petition or affidavit. So really just follow what is being done in your particular county with your particular judicial officers. Now I hand it off to you, Raina. All right. So um, when you're working with a client or a petitioner around an order of protection or in any circumstance in which they, uh, the person that you're working with is going into some sort of evidentiary hearing, there's a thought process that needs to go along about, okay, so what are, what is the information, what's the evidence that we want to get in and in front of the court? And does any of that evidence, whether it be testimony or whether it be uh, material hard evidence, is that going to, do we need anybody else to help us figure out how to get that in? Um, do we need a witness? Um, and so, you know, thinking about things like, okay, so you want to establish family or household membership. Are you going to need a witness or are you going to need anybody else to help establish that? Probably not, right? That's testimony that can come from your client who can say, you know, the respondent is my husband, girlfriend, ex-wife, uh, you know, baby mama, baby daddy, whatever, right? I mean, that's testimony that can come from your own client because they know that information and it comes from them. However, sometimes when we start, although it's still really important that your client testify to the relationship because the court needs to technically make a finding that there is a family or household relationship as that's a requirement to experience domestic abuse. However, on some other things like did domestic abuse occur, did one of those five things happen between the family or household member and the petitioner, sometimes you're going to need, there's various information that you want to get in to help support that. And sometimes you want to get in statements that are made beyond somebody other than the petitioner to get those statements in. So you may, you want to think through and talk with your client about are there additional witnesses that you're going to need to be able to get this information in, which also means thinking about what kind of evidence is there. So do you need a witness to lay foundation um, and uh, um, to be able to get uh, evidence in, you often need to lay what we call lay foundation for that evidence. And that basically means you need to be able to show the court that it's authentic. So if you need to get in a, you want to um, submit a photograph to the court um, of the picture of a, of a big black eye that's on your client, um, basically what the victim would need or the petitioner would need to be able to say is, this is a picture, it's a picture of me, and that is an accurate representation of that big black eye that I had at the time that the picture was taken. All right, and that idea, that's that laying in that foundation, that's telling the court that this picture is authentic, that it's not, it hasn't been um, edited or um, modified in any way. So you may need a witness to lay foundation. The picture one, in general, the individual can lay it for themselves, but sometimes you need law enforcement to lay foundation as it relates to a police report. 
Um, you may need a witness to be able to get statements by other people, including children, in. Um, just because a parent heard a child say something, it's that's hearsay under the rules of evidence, and you uh, might need a witness to be able to get those children's statements in. And we'll talk a little bit more about children's statements. You may need a witness to provide evidence of like a violation, and that might be the probation officer or again, a law enforcement officer. Or you may need a witness to provide expert testimony depending on the circumstances and what makes sense with that client and, and that courthouse and that kind of thing. Um, uh, you also want to be thinking about if one is asking for child support, whether that be through an order for protection or through um, a custody or parenting time action or a divorce action. Um, you may need, if the client's on public assistance, you should the client should be notifying the county um, to let them know that they're seeking child support and to also see if they can be uh, be at the hearing to help um, seek that child support for uh, the victim. And then finally, uh, then the next question is, are you gonna need to subpoena anybody? If you've determined that it looks like you're gonna need some witnesses, some live people to show up, to provide testimony, to lay foundation or get a statement in or provide additional evidence, um, are you gonna need to subpoena those people? And if you do, how are you gonna pay for it? Um, and that's where sometimes what's a supplemental IFP or a supplemental fee waiver, which would come into play. It's just like the fee waiver that you sign or that you ask for for clients for other things around court fees. But this is one where the court comes in and says um, it allows somebody to do additional things beyond the court fees like subpoenas because it's necessary for them to be able to advance their case. So that also might be something that... Um, is that that could be an option if they need to seek subpoenas. Um, so you need to uh, also remember about, uh, <clears throat> so when you're preparing, if there are gonna be exhibits, if you are gonna pre present, you know, solid evidence, um, if there are documents, you wanna make sure you're making copies. You wanna have a copy for um, or your client wants to have a copy for themselves, they need to have a copy for the respondent, and they need to have a copy oh, for the Did we court. lose Raina? No. I'm still here. <laughs> um, and uh, then we, so you need to make sure that there are copies of all these documents, because the truth is, is that you ultimately have to exchange these, and it's just so much cleaner to have everything ready and to go. Because otherwise, you're handing your copy, the original copy, to the court, to the respondent, back to the court, and the court arguably should be taking that into its possession and keeping it for 90 days. So always better to have made copies. Um, and then if you're seeking child support, um, very helpful. Uh, go to the child support calculator from Minnesota and print out those child support guidelines in that calculator and be able to provide that to the court. Um, it uh, forms a much stronger basis than just saying, well, I want child support. Well, how much do you want? I don't know. Well, based on what? I don't know. Like, so help the court, help the court help you. Um, so, and then of course, always remember to discuss safety with the client prior to the hearing. You guys are advocates, I know you rock that. So, um, but make sure that you're discussing that safety with the client before the hearing. And also having thoughts about, okay, so you wanna introduce this as evidence, are you sure? Because once it's introduced as evidence, A, the other side's gonna see it, B, becomes part of a public record. Um, and so that can be a pretty significant problem. All right, Raina, I guess on. a couple of people said they lost sound. Okay. So is your mic showing movement when you talk? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. I couldn't hear you for a second either, but I can hear you now. So is everything good for everyone else? Can, I, can everyone hear? Yeah, I, okay, good, they said, okay. Uh, Take you on, Raina. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're moving on? We're moving yeah. on. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so um, does anyone have any questions before we hop into evidence that's presented at the hearing, Ty? No, there are no questions at this uh, point. Okay, so we wanted to start this off, as Raina alluded to at the top of the presentation. Um, we do get calls from people who seem 
confused about how to properly admit evidence at these um, at these particular hearings. So we were trying to come up with a couple of our most common calls. Um, I have definitely gotten a lot of calls from people who um, maybe the the judge that they're appearing in front of, maybe it's a small county, maybe there's only one judge, and they assume the judge, you know, may have been the judge on their family law matter, or may have been the judge that, um, you know, convicted the respondent of certain criminal actions. And so they just assume the judge was there, the judge should know about his convictions, the judge, you know, was the one who put that, you know, who who gave them those convictions. They were there on the family law matter. They should know all of these things already. So I don't need to enter anything into evidence because the judges already know that. And the judge is going to consider that in my order for protection hearing. Um, and that, uh, my, my advice to people is to assume that the judge only knows what you're presenting to them at your particular hearing. Even if the judge does know about the respondent's convictions or does know about what's going on in other hearings does not mean that they are going to consider it in the order for protection hearing. So I think the, you know, the, the golden rule should be that you should only assume the judge knows what you are presenting to them and the evidence that you are submitting to them in, in the hearing at hand, in the order for protection hearing. Um, we also get a lot of calls saying, um, you know, uh, I'm asking them about their evidence. I'm asking them how they're going to, you know, prove all of the standards that we've already talked about, um, how they're going to prove that um, this uh, household member has committed domestic abuse. And they say, well, you know, my neighbor saw it and I got them to write up this super great affidavit describing everything and it's notarized and I'm going to bring it to court and we submit it to the judge. Um, we get a lot of these magical notarized affidavits that they're going to bring into these hearings that are going to solve the case for them. And, you know, that's considered hearsay, which Raina is going to talk about in a short minute. And so that's something that the judge cannot consider. If they, you know, bring a notarized affidavit in, even if it's the best notarized affidavit they've ever seen and they hand it to the judge, the judge is going to say, I cannot accept this. This is considered hearsay. The person who has written this affidavit needs to come to the courtroom and testify. Um, in order for that evidence to be submitted. And so um, these are just some things that we wanted to make sure people, you know, understand that there are a lot of clients that we've spoken to over the phone that have these misconceptions. And now hearsay. So what the heck is hearsay? You hear lawyers talk about hearsay all the time, right? You know, you can't, uh, that's hearsay and all that kind of stuff. So what is hearsay? Uh, uh, technically, hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Um, and so if you want to go to the next slide, Rachel. Sure. So an example of hearsay is my neighbor told me the next day that she saw my husband pull up to the house in a rage and she knew something bad was going to happen. That's hearsay. OK, um, and it's because the statement is that a neighbor told her something else. Right. So the neighbor told her that um, that the husband pulled up. So that's the statement and that he was in a rage um, and it's made by somebody who's not in court. Right, because the neighbor isn't there testifying to it. It's the petitioner is testifying to it instead of the neighbor. And it's being offered to prove the truth of the matter. And that's that the husband pulled up to the house in a rage. All right, so that's hearsay. So anytime somebody wants to say something um, by somebody else to try to prove that something occurred, you're in hearsay land, all right? And then you can also have hearsay within hearsay. So my neighbor told me that their friend saw, um, you know, my husband at the bar. OK, that's double hearsay. And you have to be able to overcome both of the hearsays. Um, sometimes uh, um, and then there are some exceptions to hearsay, depending on the circumstances. And we're going to talk about some of those exceptions. Um, but in general, if somebody, if you're, if, if your client wants to get on the stand and testify to something that somebody else said, can't do that. All right. So you got to start thinking about, well, if that's what they want to do, then we need to figure out either an exception to hearsay, or we need to get that person who actually said those things or saw whatever they saw and then told them that's who's going to need to come and testify. 
So another example um, is when my husband got home, he stormed into the house and started yelling at me. And I told him, quiet down. The kids are in the other room. All right. That's not hearsay. OK, because the person who is testifying is the one who made the statement. And while this is tech, feels like an out of court statement because they weren't in court when they made it, it's the idea that the testimony of that person is not out of court. So the testimony of that person is here in the court and they are the ones who said it. And you can always testify to the, to the statements that you have always said. All right. So anything that the that your client has said, they can always testify to. Um, something somebody else said, then that gets, there needs to be an exception to. We'll talk about how you get in statements by abuser. So, so again, so uh, something that is also not hearsay, um, although it kind of feels like it, it's just defined not that way, is something called admission of a party opponent. And so that basically means the other side <laughs> Great. So for most for most of our cases, it's going to be the respondent. So whoever's on the other side of this case and any statements that they made that might be admissions um, or even just in general, any statements that they made um, to the petitioner. OK, so they got to be to the petitioner. Um, those statements are defined not as hearsay and the petitioner could testify to them. So, for example, um, the petitioner could say, um, uh, you know, the respondent told me later that he's sorry that he hit me and he promised it would never happen again. OK, so the, the petitioner can testify to those things. There are some other really common hearsay exceptions um, that folks might be familiar with. One is probably excited utterance. I think most people are familiar with this idea of excited utterance. Um, and so that, that basically means that um, there's an exception to hearsay because when you are in a very excited state, when something exciting or, um, and I don't mean necessarily exciting in a good way either, but when something exciting occurs, uh, there is a belief that one is less likely to lie when that is happening, and that's um, why there is an exception to the hearsay uh, to the hearsay rule. So, for example, an excited utterance could be as the police show up, a neighbor shouts to the police, "Hurry! I think he's going to kill her." Um, and then law enforcement may get called to the stand in a criminal case or in some other case and be able to testify to the fact of what the neighbor said. You may not necessarily have to have the neighbor come in and testify um, because of the excited utterance of what the neighbors, of what the neighbor, um, of the exciting situation and the statements of the neighbor. Um, that is a lot of the ways that also uh, statements to 911 operators made by victims also come in with the beyond the present sense impression piece, but also just generically their statements about what happened in the past. Um, depending on the circumstances, it's another way of that those types of statements come in. Another exception that is really common is again that present sense impression. Um, and as we have here, uh, those can be statements to 911 operators describing what is happening. It could be, um, you could this could come up in a situation where you have uh, mom or petitioner is on the phone with a child and a child is directly explaining what they are seeing in that moment. All right, so it is it is telling somebody or describing what is happening in the immediate moment. So you know, uh, you know, to nine one one, it's you know, hurry, hurry, you need to get here right now. Somebody is banging on the door. They're trying to get in. They're kicking on the door. Oh my goodness, they're kicking in the door. The door is coming down. Oh my gosh, you got to get here right now. Okay, that's a present sense impression. I am telling you what is happening in the moment, right? And so that's an exception to hearsay. And hearsay is really confusing. Uh, hearsay is really confusing for attorneys. Um, and so if you are confused by this, you are in good company. Um, so if you do have hearsay questions, please feel free to call us. Or and if you don't understand it completely today, that's okay. Yep. Um, okay. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about laying foundation. Raina has already talked about it a, briefly earlier. Um, but, you know, not to detract from any of the other awesome slides we have coming up, but the laying foundation slide is maybe one of the more important ones um, because you need to do it every time you are offering evidence to the court. You need to lay foundation. And the reason for that is, and, you know, again, Raina has already said this, but 
laying foundation is a way of proving to the court that this evidence is authentic um, and it is relevant to the case at hand. And so that needs to be done before a court can consider that evidence. And so we kind of broke it down into three particular parts that you need to do to lay foundation. Um, as Raina was saying at the beginning, to make copies of all of your evidence, if it is something that you can make a copy of. Um, if it isn't something you can make a copy of, if it's more um, solid evidence, if it's more like, um, like a broken cell phone or like a voicemail recording, um, it may be something that you have to show to the opposing party or you have to play for the opposing party prior to the hearing. Um, but if it is something you can make a copy of, then you need to, again, make that personal copy for yourself, make a copy for the opposing party because they have the right to, to look at it as well and to make a copy for the court. And then you'll have to go through the process of laying foundation, um, which again, Raina has already talked about a little bit, and I'm going to use again the example of photographic evidence in a second. But that laying foundation is just providing the court with enough detail, enough um, evidence to show that, that the, the piece of evidence that you're trying to submit is authentic. So um, the Example I have below about photographic evidence, you may answer be answering the questions, do you recognize this photo? Okay, if you recognize it, what is it of? When was this photo taken? How is it that you recognize this photo? Were you there? Did you see the person take the picture? Are you the person who took the picture? And a very important question is, does it fairly, accurate, fairly and accurately depict what you saw on that date? So there was no alterations to this photo. This is a fair and accurate depiction of what, whatever you're taking a picture of, what it looked like on that day. Um, and so the third very important step for laying foundation is you offer that evidence to the court. So after you give a copy to the party, after you lay the foundation necessary to prove to the court that this evidence is authentic and relevant, then you'll offer that evidence to the court to consider in your case. And we're gonna kind of, when we go through these different pieces of evidence, um, Rain and I are gonna talk a little bit more about how to lay foundation for all of the different kinds of evidence. So let's hop into the specifics, shall we? Just um, butt in for a second. Sure, please, I'll back up. Um, so basically, you know, so, I mean, and all this is often going to happen while the victim is testifying. And so right. the victim's going to be doing this stuff for herself. So the victim's going to be, you know, so for, we'll use the photographic evidence piece. So victim's telling her story about, you know, about how the assault that occurred and the bruises that she received. And then she would say to the court, I have pictures of my bruises, Your Honor. I would like to offer them to the court and say, and the victim would say, I have copies for the, for the respondent and you can, and and the off the court will probably call the the uh, deputy in the courtroom over, you know, to come and get it and bring it over to the respondent. Right. And then um, you hand the copies to the court, and then the victim would say, um, you know, I want to let. So this was a picture that my friend took and um, we took it, uh, you know, within uh, 12 hours of the assault that I just described. Um, and these bruises are a on my arm or whatever it's depict, whatever it's showing, you know, these bruises on my arm are a fair and accurate uh, depiction of the bruises that I had. Um, and so I'm offering this to the court um, to be to please consider it as evidence. All right. Great, so thank you. It, it doesn't need to be like I know it feels really overwhelming and super scary. Um, and uh, and in general, the vast majority of judges will also help your client along yeah. if they're if they don't have an attorney. So part of it is just letting the court know that you have evidence. Um, the court will be so happy that there are copies for the court and for the other party, mm -hmm. um, and that you're ask you know and that you're following some proper procedure will make the court just thrilled. So. Right. Yep. And I do think, you know, again, it's important to remind clients that if they are going to submit evidence that the opposing party is going to get to see it. Yep. Um, you can't submit something that the other party can't see. So just be prepared to be offering that to the opposing party as well. All right. Rana, oh, you oops, want to this is me. <laughs> this is you. <laughs> All right. So, um, 
sometimes we want uh, clients will want to offer uh, prior prior or current court orders, and those may be showing up again uh, in order for protection proceedings to be able to um, obtain a subsequent or an extension. You may want to show that there was a prior HRO and now one is seeking an OFP or vice versa. You may want to show that there is or has been a DANCO, a domestic abuse no contact order in a, in a criminal file. Um, or you may be wanting to show what's been happening in the family court and any one of these variety of things. So sometimes you want to get current or prior orders um, into, uh, into your hearing. Um, so one, you, uh, as we talked about, you can certainly attach um, uh, those to the uh, to the affidavit and the petition for whichever one of these things that you're doing. It's very common in family court um, that a whole ton of exhibits are attached to the affidavit. Um, and whether those are ever actually admitted into court as evidence is one thing, but it's very, very common that to attach a whole ton of exhibits. Um, so you can um, arguably attach them to an order for protection or a harassment restraining order or to a family court or to some other, you know, depending on what's going on. This could be a housing court. So you may want to attach it as an exhibit. When we're talking about prior or current court orders, um, uh, if, if the order itself, whether it is certified, then it can be admitted as evidence without any further foundation. And so that would be, again, so the client is testifying and then would say, I can, you know, uh, I had an order for protection in the past, Your Honor. Um, I have a certified copy of the former order. I've made copies for the respondent and for the, and here's the original for the court. And I have a copy for myself. I'd like to admit this as evidence. And then this is what I'm trying to show, you know, in as you can see then in the former order or whatever you're trying to figure out from that reference. Like maybe there's something in the order you want to show, or maybe it's just the fact you want to say, look, I've already had two of these suckers. So give me my 50 your order for protection now. I mean, don't ever say it like that. That never goes well. But, right, so you can often, you can get them in as certified copies without further foundation. Um, you know, often courts, even if they're not certified, they may accept it depending on if the other side is going to object and what's their valid objection. But if you really want to avoid any possibility of concern, do a certified copy. If you're in the same county, so you got your order for protection in uh, Anoka County, and now you're back for, you know, trying to seek a 50-year order for protection in Anoka County. If you're in the same county, a judge can take judicial, what's called judicial notice, um, and say, oh yeah, I can see that our county has issued this prior order for protection. Um, and uh, how and they can see that and they can look that up and they can know. The problem is if you want to reference anything inside of it beyond just saying generically this exists, you're still going to want to make a copy um, for the court because they're not going to be they may not be able to see it. Um, you know, a lot of stuff now they can see from their bench and they can type in court numbers and all that kind of stuff. But I don't you know, it depends on how far back it goes. Um, <gasps> oh, <laughs> Ty just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> oh my god. Everyone is okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're fine over here. Ty just like came in my door. I didn't know what was going on. And she came in like on the other side of me. And so I turned around the opposite way. And she scared the crap out of me. Anyway, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, is what if there is a prior order against the petitioner? Are you required to disclose? Um, you are the, if one is filing an order for protection um, or a harassment restraining order or in a family court decision, um, uh, if it's a petition for a domestic, for a, um, for divorce, the form and per statute requires disclosure of, of any time that an order for protection has been issued between the parties. So you have to disclose um, in your petition because that's required. Um, do you have to produce it for the court later on? Heck no, that's not your responsibility unless somehow it's helpful to you. I mean, only produce evidence that's helpful to you. Do, are you required by statute to disclose? Yes, you are. And you know, just do your due diligence because you have to. 
um, but whether or not that goes any farther than being uh, uh, written on the petition is something else. Um, okay, and then uh, you'll write, you'll raise that prior order. Again, that happens either it can happen either through the client or depending on your your client strategy, it could happen through the opposing party. Um, you know, depending on what you're trying to show, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, uh, so you can bring it in either through through the client where the client testifies to the fact that she went to court and had a, you know, got it this order for protection in X year and it was for two years and here's the order. Um, or if you're trying to prove uh, maybe that there have been other court orders against the opposing party, um, you, may, you might want to raise, raise it through them, depending on. And then you would offer it to the court as evidence after that. Okay. Now that I freaked everybody out, and that's going to be immortalized on uh, the a YouTube channel forever and a day. <laughs> I didn't figure out how to cut that out. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, police reports. Um, so uh, police reports are often very useful in seeking of an order for protection. Um, and while you can, again, attach that to the petition and affidavit, um, whether that be for an order of protection, a harassment restraining order, whether that be in a family court file, or I don't know why, there, there might be a police report that's helpful in a housing and a landlord tenant type file. You can attach that to your affidavit and it would be considered as an exhibit, but it's not evidence. Um, and this is really important. Police reports, um, any of the statements made by law enforcement, any of that narrative in a police report, that's hearsay. And you need that officer to come and testify to it. So I think I got a call just two weeks ago where a victim was really upset and she was like, and the court wouldn't even take my police report. And I'm like, no. I said, was the officer there to testify? And she said, no. And I said, well, that's because anything that's in that police report is hearsay. Um, and so that's, th these are the things that you as advocacy need to be able to explain to a victim, like that, ba like these are kind of the basic things like, okay, well, if you want to introduce that police report, you're going to have to have that officer here to testify to it. Mm -hmm. Um, because police reports are hearsay and they don't just come in because you want to give them to the court and to prepare your client for that. Um, that's that's a really important piece of good advocacy. So you either need, you need to subpoena the officer who wrote the report to testify. Um, you know, sometimes uh, multiple officers respond and multiple officers will uh, write as part of that police report, provide separate narratives. If you want to uh, add, if you want anything from both of those narratives, you'll have to subpoena both of those police officers. Um, uh, uh, and then keep in mind that that's subpoenaing and it, this is when it's good to have a good relationship with your law enforcement um, uh, departments in your district. Um, so that figuring out things like, um, you know, is the client going to have to pay to subpoena the officer? And if they are, how much is that going to be? And how is that going to work out? So um, good relationships with your departments are very helpful here. Finally, there is an argument that if the, if the sole reason that you want to admit the police report is just the fact that law enforcement was called, but for nothing else, you might be able to get around here say on that. But I think I think there are plenty of judges who would be resident because they don't want to accidentally read some narrative or something like that. Um, but you might be able to get it in for the sole fact that law enforcement was called and not for why they were called, not for what happened when they were called, not for what was said while they were called or any of that kind of stuff. Um, if you want any of that to come in, you absolutely got to you got to subpoena the police officer. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about photos. We've used photos as an example so far throughout the presentation. Um, so this is a it's a you know a good clear cut example of how to lay foundation, how to get that kind of evidence in. Um, so as we were saying, um, you need to be able to lay that foundation, show that this photo that you're offering as evidence to the judge is a fair and accurate representation of whatever you're trying to show. So let's say that um, you're working with a client who has a picture of a giant like gouge in the wall from you know when something was thrown into the wall during the argument, and you want to be able to admit that photo as evidence to the judge. 
um, then you either need to say, you know, I was there when the photo was taken, I've seen this, this is an accurate representation of what happened, you know, mere moments after, you know, the the domestic abuse occurred. Or you can say, I was the person that took this photo, I was there. Um, any way in order to, any person who is able to prove that this photo is a fair and accurate representation of whatever is depicted. So oftentimes that's a photographer, the person who was in the room when the picture was taken, or if it's of a, a bodily injury, if it's of bruises, then it could be the person depicted in the photo saying, you know, I know this is a fair and accurate representation of what was taken. I was there. That's me. That's that's what it looked like 12 hours after after the abuse happened. Um, and we added a little reminder at the end of this slide saying make sure the photo helps your case. Um, we have, I have seen where people have submitted, let's say, pictures of a black eye. And based on lighting, based on when the picture was taken, um, you, you know, you might look at that picture and say, I, I don't see a black eye. Uh, this to me doesn't look like a photo of an injury. Um, so you need to make sure that this photo is actually something that's going to help your case and not hurt your case. So it's, a, you know, maybe important to review some of those pieces of evidence with your clients to make sure that, you know, what they're thinking is helpful is actually helpful. Um, and then there's other physical evidence. So an example would be maybe a broken cell phone if a cell phone was thrown or ripped clothing if in the course of an argument, you know, he grabbed her clothing and ripped it. Um, and again, kind of like the photo, it's very similar in how you lay foundation. Um, you just need to have a person there who has knowledge of, and let's let's use the ripped clothing as an example. So they need to have knowledge of the fact of the condition of that sweater before the assault occurred. So, you know, the sweater didn't have any rips in it. You know, you bought it a week ago. It was brand new. Um, the cause of the destruction, maybe that he had grabbed the neck and, you know, pulled on it and it caused a rip in the neck. And that the current condition is the same as it was immediately after the assault. So, you know, if you had a broken cell phone that was thrown across the room, but heaven forbid you, you know, survive without your cell phone, you went and you got it fixed right away. Bringing that cell phone in isn't going to be overly helpful. Maybe if you took a picture of the broken cell phone, that's something that um, that you can submit as, as evidence. But um, as with photographs, make sure that what you're submitting is helpful in your case. Okay. Ty, do we have any questions? No, no other questions. Okay. I just want to avoid freaking myself out again. Okay. So oh um, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, so medical records. Um, medical records are really difficult to get admitted. Um, and again, because anything that's written in your medical record is hearsay, right? You didn't, the, the client didn't say it. Um, it's what the uh, doctor said or observed or did or, right, so it wasn't your client. So it's all hearsay. Um, so normally to be able to get medical records in, you either need the medical professional who created the record itself, so your doctor or the, the client's doctor, or sometimes you can get stuff through the, med the records custodian, which is probably even a bigger pain in the rear to try to get than your doctor or your therapist or your whatever. Again, most of the time you're going to have to subpoena those people. You might be able to get around some of the hearsay that's um, made that, that could exist within those medical records, like statements that were made to the medical professional. Um, there is a hearsay exception for statements made for medical diagnosis, but that's more about the hearsay as it relates to the medical professional testifying about the hearsay. So the doctor saying the child told me that daddy was doing this to them, that's the exception to allow the medical professional to testify to what the child told the professional. Um, and then uh, um, a hearsay ex exception of existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. Again, that's going to allow the medical professional to um, get around uh, those statements um, that are in the um, that are in the record that might be technical that are it would be that double hearsay. 
Um, so medical records are very difficult to be able to get in. It's going to depend on that patient's or the client's re uh, relationship with their doctor. And the other thing that I really want to remind you is that these documents then become part of the public record, right? Because if the client is successful in getting them in, now they're part of the OFP or the family court or the HRO, or, right? They're part of that record. Um, and you may be also alerting the respondent about various records that exist that the respondent now might become very interested in having access to if, say, there's a concurrent family court file also going on as it re involves the respondent. So you just be really careful and think very carefully and help your client think really carefully about whether medical records make sense to be able to be admitted or are there other ways that you can get that information in without having to actually pull in the medical record. So just medical records make me oogie on a regular basis because <laughs> yeah, you know, you're putting it out there and that's, you may not want to put it out there, right? All right, let's go on to, um, sometimes folks want to get criminal records in. Sometimes, you know, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, remember that if you want to get a criminal record of the respondent in or the other opposing party in, that criminal act needs to be relevant. So if I'm seeking an order for protection against Joe Blow and 10 years ago, Joe Blow committed a burglary, uh, you know, or did a bank robbery, I'm not, you're going to have to prove to the court how said bank robbery, if you want to try to get that record in, how said bank robbery is relevant to the abuse or the domestic abuse that uh, you're going to talk about today. And it might be, right? But you, but the client's going to have to make that connection. You're going to have to show how it's relevant. Um, if uh, the client has certified copies of the uh, respondent's convictions, those are again, just like certified copies of court orders, those are admissible without any further authentication or any further laying of foundation. Non-certified copies, so that would be like the printing out of a Minsis, right? Of a, <laughs> we've all done this, we all go to Minsis, we look up the opposing party and we print out their criminal, well, at least the criminal record we can see, right? And that's gonna be convictions. Um, and so non-certified copies, um, those you can use if the action took place in the same county. So if you're seeking a, a you know, a order for protection in Anoka County and there's a criminal action in Anoka County, <clears throat> the court can take judicial notice of that conviction. Um, otherwise, you're going to need certified copies. Um, and then there's limits about whether or not the conviction was a felony. Uh, if it's a non-felony, um, and uh, um, basically, like if it's a felony, you ha you can only use it to prove a fact that's essential. Like you can only you can only talk about the incidents the incident that occurred as it was um, essential to the conviction. So if somebody was convicted of first degree assault um, because they caused substantial disfigurement, permanent substantial disfigurement to the victim and now she's seeking an order for protection and she wants to say in the past he has been convicted of first degree assault, here's my certified uh, copy of his conviction and um, what ha and what happened was is that he caused this disfigurement, he blew out my eye socket and now I uh, I have much limited sight out of one of my eyes because of that. That would be essential to the conviction. Um, if it was something a a, a, a separate from that, you would not be able to get that in. Um, Non-felonies convictions can, all, uh, can be used to show some sort of pattern of behavior, intent, that it was not an accident. It can also go to show reasonable fear, or you can use it to impeach the witness. Um, Prior and always remember though, just because somebody did something in the past doesn't mean that they did it right now. So it you can never use prior acts to prove a current act. Um, so just because they assaulted you in the past doesn't mean that they did assault you this time. You're going to have to prove it through other things beyond just the fact that it occurred in the past. Um, I often like to try to, especially depending on the uh, respondent, um, maybe instead of actually producing a criminal record that the victim is trying to get in, go about it by trying to get it in through the respondent, asking the respondent, 
um, and then you can use it to impeach them back around. So like, um, you know, asking the respondent, I had one particular incident, and this maybe doesn't come up very often for folks, but I was um, uh, in an order of protection hearing. I knew that the respondent had these really old felonies. Um, they were totally unrelated to domestic abuse. They were like theft or something from like 15 years ago, but they were felony, uh, felony thefts. And he gets on the stand to testify and he talks about what a perfect upstanding young man that he is and how, um, you know, he coaches hockey, literally like uh, Tykes hockey or whatever it's called. I'm spacing on uh, the word, but he coaches hockey and, um, you know, he couldn't possibly have this order for protection would just, you know, would destroy his reputation. And so my first question out of the box when I got cross-examination was, you're a convicted felon, aren't you? Like, because it goes right to his point of, oh, I'm such an upstanding citizen. Wait, no, you're, but you're a convicted felon and you're worrying about an order for protection as being a problem for you. Maybe you should worry about your felonies first, right? You know, so it was going, I was using those convictions more to impeach him um, and so sometimes you can get that stuff in through them. Are they going to admit to it? Um, you know, and then if they lie, then maybe coming back around to be able to prove the fact, no, they really do have these convictions. Um, so that, that might be an easier way to get stuff in as opposed to having to bring it in through uh, the victim or through the petitioner. Right. Okay, so I'm going to talk okay. a little bit about before you go, Rachel. Oh, before yep. you start, there is a question for Rena about the previous slide, and the question is, how does the prior acts work with stalking now? Um. So the so when we're talking about, and I guess I need more context because we're talking. I mean, with prior acts and stalking, are we talking about in a criminal case? And that's not going to be us trying to figure out how to get that evidence. And um, if we're talking about prior acts as it relates to uh, um, harassment restraining orders, what I'm trying to say is, and so when we're talking about harassment restraining orders and we have, to, and you're looking at trying to show that harassment occurred because there were two or more incidences that made the victim feel um, unsafe or that their safety, security, or privacy was being um, infringed upon, what you are trying to show is harassment occurred. And harassment occurred because there were these two acts or more that equal harassment. What you can't say is last year, um, I got a harassment, I was able to show that harassment occurred. I got a harassment restraining order. And that therefore means today that the behavior that he just did is, is default harassment you're still gonna have to prove that whatever that behavior is rises to the level of infringing on the petitioner safety, security, and privacy. And as it relates to a harassment restraining order, you're gonna have to show that two incidences occurred because you can't extend a harassment restraining order. So that's my point of prior acts are not admissible to prove the current act. Um, when we're talking about stalking, you have to show two or more incidences of stalking. So, but just because I proved stalking had occurred last year, doesn't now mean that I, it default is occurring right now. It could be part of a giant pattern of saying stalking has been going on. And here are the multiple things that have continued to happen since last year. But the sheer fact that it occurred last year does not prove that it is occurring right now. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, that did answer the question. Great. Any so, other questions, Ty? No, that was it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get in the statements of children. Um, this is a very complicated thing, um, and and again can be difficult for you know for attorneys as well as people who are representing themselves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it um, on this particular slide, but I think our default is going to be that if you are working with a client who's trying to get in the statement of their child, um, it might not be a bad idea to give us a call first to kind of talk through the implications of what that might be, about how they can go about doing it, that, about whether or not that's something that they actually want to do. Um, so 
the easiest way to get in the statement, well, I don't want to say the easiest, but the easiest for the sake of legal arguments to get the statement of a child in, to, for it not to be considered hearsay, is to have the child come into the courtroom and testify to what they saw, to what they think, to what, you know, to whatever uh, goes to prove that the respondent had committed the abuse, either against them or against the petitioner. Um, uh, there are certain judicial officers that do not like to have children testifying. I would say that they are more reticent when it comes to parents, when it comes to grandparents, when it comes to that blood relationship or close um, blood relationship, but they might be less concerned if it's a non-family member or if it's a distant family member or a neighbor, um, you know, someone that doesn't have that close tie or relationship to the child. So it really depends on the judicial officer. Um, and if you are able to, or you do decide that you want your child to come into court to testify, then it might also be worthwhile to have a discussion with the judge to see whether or not that testimony can be taken outside of the courtroom, potentially back in the judge's chambers. Um, I've clerked for a judge where that was his default. He preferred if children were going to testify, and he was really um, reticent to have children testify at all. Usually they had to be a little older. Um, so if the children are really young, I don't even think he would have considered it. But if they're a little older, you know, if their testimony is necessary, if they think it's going to be helpful, if it isn't for that close family member, then a judge might be willing to bring the child back into their chambers and have them testify there so they don't have the stress of sitting on a stand in an open courtroom and testifying in front of all of the people in the audience. Um, so that's something to consider um, because if a child is in a courtroom testifying to what they have observed, then it would not be considered hearsay. Any other statement that you would bring in of a child if they're not the, the, in the courtroom testifying, it would be considered hearsay. So it would have to come in through some kind of hearsay exception. And so we put um, a couple of, you know, options down there. It's certainly not the only uh, potential options or exceptions you can use to get in a child statement, but potentially a child statement can come in through a third party. Um, Raina's already talked a little bit about medical professionals, so there are exceptions to hearsay for medical professionals if the statement is made for that medical diagnosis or treatment, or if it had to go to their then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. And so it's possible that certain statements of children can come in through the medical professional if it fits within those exceptions. Um, and maybe Raina can speak to this more exactly, but we, we have seen that guardians, uh, guardian ad litems, get statements in uh, maybe more easily. Um, guardians reports, I know, are allowed to be entered into evidence, but that doesn't mean that what's being put in the report can't also be considered hearsay and that a party can object to certain statements based on the fact that it's hearsay. Um, I know that some things come in from guardian ad litems because they're saying that it's not actually hearsay because the child's statement is not being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So, for example, the, the child statement wouldn't be offered to prove that, you know, daddy actually hit mommy, but it's being offered to establish the child's state of mind, what they believed was happening in that moment. So they're not actually doing it to prove that, you know, that daddy hit mommy, but they're using it to prove what the child's mental condition or, you know, what their current um, state of mind was at that time. So there are a lot of different really nuanced hearsay exceptions um, that you can get children's statements in under, but they can be very complicated um, and are difficult for even people who've been practicing for a very long time, um, understanding how to get statements of children in can be difficult. Um, oftentimes under a variety of other hearsay exceptions, you can bring in statements of children, but part of, you know, complying with that hearsay exception is to provide advance notice to the opposing party. And so it's really important if you're working with a client who wants to get in a statement of their child that you're giving us a call and we can have a more in-depth discussion with you about it because it really is very fact specific and it can change um, depending on the circumstances and depending on whether or not it's actually going to be beneficial to your client to do so. Um, it can be very complicated. Raina, do you have anything else to add to what I've said? No, it's very complicated. It's super complicated. I wasn't even sure, you know, we weren't sure how much we wanted to put in this. Um, enough, I guess, to, to intimate to everybody that it's complicated. 
And um, so if you are considering this, please give us a call. We'll talk through it with you more specifically. Yeah, judges get it wrong, attorneys get it wrong. Um, you know, for those of you who were at new laws this year, we saw that the vast majority of orders for protection that were overturned were overturned because of uh, improper um, admittance of evidence as it related to things that children said. Um, right. So, yeah. I mean, it can, it's not to say that, you know, you can't get a child statement in, but it is more complicated and really does require some advanced thought and preparation. Um, so the other piece of evidence I'm going to talk about is recorded media or voicemail. So what I mean by recorded media, I often have seen cases where um, people will, I don't know, record um, voices or, you know, they might shoot a video on their phone, but it's faced towards the ground or it's in their pocket and they're starting a video just because they want to have a record of what the other person is saying or what's happening at that particular time. So that's what I'm talking about when I say recorded media. Um, and so unlike other pieces of evidence where you can just make a copy, give it to the court, give it to the opposing party, this is something that you're probably going to have either on your phone or you might have it on a jump drive, you might have it on your computer. Um, and so it's something where first you should be prepared to play that recording in open court. So you need to have some sort of device in which to play the recording. Um, and also be prepared for the fact that the other party may object and say they need to hear, you know, what is being presented prior to it being presented in open court. So it might be something where the opposing party get, has the right to hear it um, prior to you playing it in open court. My experience has been, you know, judges aren't super picky with that. Um, oftentimes, Things will just get played in open court before the other party has a chance to hear it. Um, but I guess that depends on your opposing party and it depends on your judicial officer. Um, so like any other piece of evidence, when you're laying foundation for recorded media or voicemails, um, you're going to do it by playing it out loud, talk about when the recording was made, talk about why the recording was made. If you know you knew that you know he you know the opposing party, the respondent was getting all worked up and you wanted to record the incident, so you started a recording on your phone and you put it in your pocket, explain that to the courtroom, explain when and how this recording was made. Um, and then when it's being played, you will need to testify to who, what the identity of the voices are and explain how you know who it is that's speaking. So it could be, you know, that's my voice, that's the voice of my husband, and I know that because I've been married to him for 20 years, I know what his voice sounds like. Um, another thing that may seem, I mean, a lot of courts won't necessarily require this. I've certainly seen lots of people play recordings in open court without requiring a transcript, but I'm going to recommend that everybody prepare a transcript of the dialogue, not only because it allows, you know, the opposing party to have a chance to see it, and, you know, so that you may not have to play it to them before the hearing, but it also is way easier for the court. It's way easier for the court reporter. Oftentimes when these recordings are happening, there may be multiple voices, they may be talking over each other, it may be hard to understand what's going on, and it may be really hard for the court reporter to take that down into, um, into the court record, which, you know, the court record is important in case anything happens later on, anything gets appealed, that you're making a really good record of what's happening. So preparing a transcript can just be really helpful to um, make whatever you're playing a stronger piece of evidence. And there's um, no requirements around, like, I know people, uh, there, a transcript doesn't need to be very formal. You don't need to take it somewhere. Right. Like, like the victim, the, the petitioner can prepare the transcript and just right. sign off on it and say that this is an accurate um, uh, transcription of what was said in this, you know, piece right. of media. So it doesn't need to be very formal. So don't worry. And I don't even think it needs to be notarized. It's really more of a benefit for the court and for the court reporter to make sure that it gets uh, memorialized in the record well. Right. Yep. Thank you. Um, oh, and on the um, uh, on the recorded media, I would also like to remind folks: make sure that it's helpful to you. Also. Oh, like, good point. Because <laughs> I had a case a lot of years ago where the respondent, where my my client had had some um, recordings of her son and him 
crying and saying that dad was hitting him and that kind of stuff. And then the respondent, when we came to the order of protection proceeding, he said that he had some recordings also. And, and so like this recording that he played involved him, like at the beginning, like you could hear him being like, why did you lie to the court? Why did you lie to your mom? Why did you say I hit you? And then, <clears throat> and then like the respondent saying, um, oh, this isn't the part that you need to hear. And then like fast forward, fast forward and fast forward, fast forward. And fast. And it felt like he fast forward forever. And then finally at the end, you hear this poor kid that he's like, oh, this is the part. Listen to this. And then the child's like, okay, I lied. Like, and all you can imagine mm -hmm. is what's been going on in the last five minutes that he was fast forwarding is that he was berating the child, screaming at him about why did you lie? And finally the kid breaks down and says, he did it right? right so make sure <laughs> that um any of the recorded media is actually helpful and right. you might want to talk with your client about what happened before the recording started and what happened after the recording started because now that everybody and their mom has a recorder in their pocket you better make sure that the other side wasn't also recording and might have mm -hmm. more that mm -hmm. they would then present and that could be harmful so really think through and be careful, right? Well, I mean, I think that that's, that's true for any of the pieces of evidence we're talking right. about today. Make sure that it's actually helpful and it really, you know, talk through it with your client because some clients may not understand that something might not make them look very good. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, text and social media, um, I know this comes up a lot, um, and the text messages are actually uh, pretty easy, and I think somehow we've overthought social media um, and, and how we get that in. Um, uh, so uh, with social media, basically what I would have folks do is take a screenshot of whatever it is that they want to show. Um, hopefully that screenshot shows the date. Um, and, uh, and then basically it's a picture, right? It, <laughs> yep. so it's just a photograph at that point. Um, and so admit it in the same way that you would admit a photograph, but make sure, and then, you know, make sure it has the name of whoever it is and how do you know that that's, and if you could even then go to their social media page or, you know, however that works for the individual social media and then take a screenshot to show that, you know, Joe Blow's, uh, a Motocani thing looks like this. And when you go to Joe Blow, then here's Joe Blow and pictures of Joe Blow and his emoticon, you know, like if it's not obvious, but you can, you know, so produce that stuff, but it's just a picture. And ultimately you say, you know, this is the, this is an accurate representation of what I saw on this day when I took this screenshot. Um, and I know people make a whole hubbubaloo about, well, how do you know they didn't fake it? It's like, well, you know what? I can, we've been faking pictures since pictures were created. Like, you know, why is a photograph all of a sudden any better than my screenshot of my um, computer? It's, it's all pictures. They're all the same and we can fudge them just as easy. Um, and, you know, and we know that photographs have been being um, uh, manipulated since the beginning of photographs. So sometimes we just need to take a step back and not make it as complicated as it is. Mm -hmm. um, text messages. Um, again, take screenshots of the text messages, take a screenshot with the name of the respondent on the top. Um, and then for laying a foundation, then you're going to take a screenshot of the respondent's contact page in the phone. The part that says Joe Blow and his phone number is 612, you know, 3910 or 397 8279. Um, and that way you can show, cause anybody can assign a name to a phone number. That way you can show it's Joe Blow and that's Joe Blow's phone number. Right. Um, and that's how you lay foundation for the text is being able to show the court, like, here's his contact information in my phone. That's his name. That's his phone number. Here are the texts under his name to me and here, you know, and so here's a copy of those texts. Make sure <laughs> um, uh, if you're going to cut out any text, they better be really, really, really irrelevant. Um, be very careful with texts um, because it's very easy to say, well, I only want to show this one that shows how mean and nasty he was. But, you know, again, there might have been texts before or after that provide context 
um, that really make your client not look so good. So be uh-huh. really careful um, and uh, making sure that if you're going to have a stream of texts, make sure not to cut out any because you don't want the court to think that um, you're trying to edit uh, content. Yeah. And I've definitely seen that with social media as well. Someone bringing in a Facebook post and then the the other party brings up that post and you can see all the comments that followed. Mm-hmm. And you know, in a way that doesn't always make your client look good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then um, finally, right? I think finally. Uh, finally. <laughs> there's a comment, Raina. Oh, there's okay. a comment yeah. about the text. So, um, Someone commented that for really lovely respondents who say just because that's my name doesn't mean it's really me. It's also possible on lots of phones to just show the actual phone number in place of the respondent contact's name. So there's no argument. Yep, you you could do that too. Um, um, I've never done that because it would require deleting the name and, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, you could do the phone number. I think the struggle is, is that then the court doesn't always like the court likes that connection of somebody's name and to them, their, to their phone number. I don't know what you think about it. Uh, Rachel, did you ever see that happen in, um, when I was in Anoka, you know, no, oftentimes I would see the name at the top. I understand what the advocate is talking about Mm -hmm. because they can say, well, they have a ton of Johns in their phone or they, you know, just put that in as my name, but that's not me. But that's why I think it's important to take a screenshot of that contact page so you can see that John matches up with the John on the contact page, which has the phone number. Right. And I think what the advocate is saying is just have only show the phone number at the top of the text Mm -hmm. exchange. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like, so if the contact page for some reason is not enough for that particular respondent or they're likely to argue it. Um, just get rid of the name. So have it, have the client deleting the name. So yeah, exactly yeah. what you said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could work there. There's also like for me um, in my WhatsApp uh, um, uh, app uh, client that I don't really use, but I have because I uh, present on it um, mm-hmm. because I don't allow it to have access to my own contacts because that creeps me out. Um, <laughs> all I ever have at the top is phone numbers. Um, and so that would be another situation where that would, you know, you'd be able to use that phone number to prove that it was somebody, the same person. So, yeah. All right. Any other questions, Ty? No, that was it. Okay. Well, no. Okay. Um, history of abuse. Um, so, I uh, just want to remind folks, as we've already said, when we're talking about totality of the circumstances, history of abuse is relevant. It is not saying because somebody hurt me before, that means indicatively that the, that they hurt me now. You still have to prove your burden um, by preponderance of the evidence that abuse occurred. But history of abuse is really relevant. And it's relevant to not only to fear of um, harm in um, an extension case. It's relevant to whether or not somebody is in imminent fear of physical harm now because maybe five years ago they were highly abusive and all this and now you're is the the victim is seeing behaviors that are making them um feel like it was that same time five years ago and they and they are afraid that a physical assault incident is going to occur again Mm -hmm. um so history of abuse is relevant um it's relevant in protective orders it's relevant in uh family court as one of um you know when we're talking about it's well it's relevant as it relates to uh Um, children. Um, It is one of the 12 best interest factors. History of abuse um, is almost never relevant if it's a straight divorce and there are no kids. Um, So just know that it's not relevant. Minnesota, we are a no-fault state, which means we don't care if the other person was an unbelievable wild jerk um, for severing the bonds of marriage, for dividing property. um, We don't care. Um, The only times that it might, and it it, it doesn't matter for spousal maintenance, um, Mm -hmm. except for some very, very, very rare circumstances where that might actually come into play. Right. But when we're talking about custody of kids and we're talking about protective orders, history of abuse is relevant. Um, and uh, history of abuse of others could be relevant if the petitioner knows about it and it's going to their fear. 
right? So it could be relevant to say, um, uh, you know, I I know that, you know, the respondent was, um, you know, you, abusive to his ex-girlfriend in and the behaviors that he had before he was abusive to ex-girlfriend is now the behaviors I'm seeing. Now, you're not going to be able to get that in unless you get ex-girlfriend to come and testify on the stand. So you're going to need ex-girlfriend to come and testify to the prior things that he was doing and then have victim testify to, and now he's doing all those things to me and I'm scared he's going to be abusive. Mm -hmm. But it is relevant. Um, and so um, testimony could occur. Um, and it also could be used to rebut a claim of accidental injury um, around the history of abuse. So do we have anything else we want to say about that, uh, Rachel? I don't think I have anything else to say about history of abuse. Um, okay. I thought I had something, but I don't think I do. I think you did a great job. Uh, we just threw in this laying foundation slide in again because it is really, really, really important. Um, and we want to drive it home uh, that in order to offer evidence, you need to do those three things. And if you can't give a copy to the opposing party, then you need to make sure the opposing party has an opportunity to hear or see it first. Um, and to lay that foundation in whatever way you need to prove to the court that the evidence is authentic and relevant, um, and then to offer that evidence to the court. So do you want to say anything else about that very important act of laying foundation, Raina? No, I, no, I mean, it, and like like I said earlier in the presentation, I guess I do have something to say. Um, <laughs> after I said no. Um, that uh, it, it, a lot of that's going to happen on the stand with, with the folks that you're working with who are representing themselves. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, you know, your honor, there were some exchanges of text messages that were really upsetting and scary, uh, you know, and so um, I have copies here of those text messages. I'd really like the court to consider them as evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I have a copy for the court. I have a copy for the respondent. Um, and then, you know, so I took these pictures of these text messages. You can see here is um, Joe Blow's, uh, his name with his contact information. That's Joe Blow's phone number. I know that that's his phone number because it's been his phone number the entire time that we've been together. And then you can see here are his text messages. I have Joe Blow's name at the top um, and in these text messages then he goes on to say you know blah 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 I'm gonna mess you up you you know stupid whore or whatever it is um, and these text messages are scaring me I'm very you know he's threatening here to harm me and I'm afraid for my physical safety and I believe he's gonna make good on these threats um, and I would like to offer these text messages to the court as evidence if that would be acceptable so like that's kind of how that process is going to work. And remembering that it, you know, it, it might feel kind of formal, but if you can, right. you can, you know, your client can write down little notes about things that they need to be able to say to help jog their memory. And then, um, and again, the court in general with pro se folks is going to help them along in that process. If you give them the right things to help them along. They can help you along if you want an officer to testify, but you got to to get that police report in. But you got to have the officer there to testify to get the police right. report in. If they're not there, the court can't help you. They can't do anything. They're stuck. So help help your client, help the court, help them. Well, and also part of it is just protecting your record, too. I mean, if you're, you know, you do need to lay foundation in order to properly admit evidence. So even though you know that the judge, you know, doesn't require you to go through all of that when you submit text messages, you know, maybe you've had experiences in your courtroom where the judge doesn't require you that they'll just pick up your phone and look at it. But, you know, for, for whatever happens in the future, if the respondent decides to appeal based on improperly admitted evidence, you know, you want to protect your record and you want to be able to protect your case. Right. Yep. Because of all those order for protections that were just overturned this last year because children's statements came in in a way that they shouldn't have come in. Right. They weren't proper under the rules of evidence and their court of appeals is just stuck. There's nothing they can do and they have to overturn. Mm -hmm. um, so doing it properly while can be time consuming and a pain um, is if you really want the OFP to stick, it can be really, really important. Yep. Yep. I agree. 
And then of course, if you have any questions, which you know we you probably do, uh, we highly recommend that you call us and talk through some of these things if you're not sure how to properly lay foundation or submit certain pieces of evidence. Do we have any questions, Ty? No, that was it. Okay. All right, well, here's our contact information. The, um, in the handouts, you also have a uh, printout of all the slides, so you have our contact information. If you do have any questions that kind of crop up later, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to talk through these issues with you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us um, now in this new year um, as we continue doing our uh, our um, webinar series of 101s for uh, domestic and sexual violence advocates to help improve their help improve legal advocacy across the state. Not that it, it was always super fantastic, but to make it even better. Um, thank you all so much. There's going to be a um, survey at the end. Please take that survey. I think when you just go to click out it's gonna you'll a survey will pop up please take that survey it's very helpful to us and i think that's it all right, all right thank, thank you, you everybody, everybody.